also like to acknowledge the contributions from my former or the current PhD students as well as the postdocs. Without them, this project would not be possible. And my former PhD students, Callum Ramsey, he will be leading the hands-on sessions today. And I'm sure Thomas will be in one of the um, uh, participants. So let's start with your presentations. First of all, I would like to start my presentation by describing what I meant by fast dynamics, followed by some industrial applications that I'm aiming for. Several industrial applications uh, associated with solid dynamics. And after that, I will revisit the classical solid dynamics that have been developed and implemented in the commercial software. I will list out the disadvantages as also advantages of those formalism. In this lecture, I will introduce a new way to address the solid dynamics by reformulating the classical solid dynamics equation into a system of first order hyperbolic system. And these equations look very, very similar to the equation used in CFD community, such as Euler equations or Navier-Stokes equations. Once the equation is well defined, I will then discretize in space using Petrov-Galkin stabilization and then evolve in time using explicit type of time integrator. So what is fast dynamics? Fast dynamics is a dynamic event that happens in a very, very short period of time, very, very quickly. Several industrial applications are associated with specific phenomena, such as car crash tests in automotive industry and the recent advance in the welding technologies, such as linear friction welding in aerospace industry, and of course, those impact-induced dynamic fracture in defense sector. This phenomenon shares some common challenging features. Most of the materials will undergo massive giant strain and they will experience shocks, discontinuities as a result of contact or dynamic fracture. More importantly, multiple physics will also be involved, such as in this linear friction welding, we are going to have a dynamic behavior then coupled with thermal where you have a temperature shock because the gradient of the temperature is massive. And we also can have very complex material model. So very complex constant model and points of the geometry might be very, very complex. To simulate this of scenario, there are a wide variety of commercial software packages that you could use such as Abacus, there was Dyna, Palmcrust, Comsol, and many others. Do they have any shortcomings? Before going into the details of the formulation that they use, let's go to the fundamental ingredients that we need for continuum mechanics. We need to have the motion of a solid. We are talking about large deformations, hence potato. So imagine that I have a potato sitting at undeformed configuration and this potato will start to deform to current configurations. And I try to track the positions. So this position initially is capital X. So capital means that the particles sitting at undeformed configurations, when you apply the forces to this potato, this potato will start to deform. And then you have this trajectory. And this is what we call mapping function. So this mapping function, depends on two arguments. Depends on the position X, capital X, which is attached to the position at and different configuration. And of course, we are dealing with dynamics. So it's function of time. Then little X is just the same particles, but now sitting at current configurations. So that's lowercase. The second ingredient that we need is F, the so-called deformation gradient tensor. So imagine that now you have a fiber, you put it there, again, you stretch the potato, you rotate the potato, this fiber will start to deform. And F is try to measure or track how this fiber stretch and how this fiber rotate from undeformed to deformed configuration. Mathematically, it's defined as 
the material gradient of a mapping function. When I say material gradient, means that this is not blah with subscript zero. So it means that you take the derivative at undeformed configurations. So F is a two-point tensor. So once you got those two entities, you are dealing with dynamics, you need velocity. So the velocity is nothing more than the time derivative of your mapping functions. So this V represents velocity. Once you have those three ingredients, let's try to revisit those equations that has been widely used in the commercial software. And usually two options. The first option is the so-called hypoelastic base formalism. And it's typically formulated in updated Lagrangian manner in current configurations. So we are dealing with solid dynamics. Certainly you need linear momentum equation or Newton's law. And this Newton law is formulated at deformed configurations. So now let's look at the variable. You have the density, that's current density. So density sitting at the current configuration. You have the velocity field. And this is sigma, represents Cauchy's stress tensor. So this is the stress tensor defined at current configuration. And little f is the body force defined at the current configuration. And this is the divergence operator diff. I write in the lower case because that's the derivative taken at deformed configuration. So that's the Newton laws formulated in deformed configuration. Once you get the velocity, you need to track the motion. So you integrate the velocity to get the motion. To complete the system, I need to tell you how I obtain my Cauchy, my stresses. In hypoelastic material, your relations will depend on the stress rate equation and the strain rate equation. So imagine now you have the stress rate, you have the strain rate, you need to put them together. You need a constitutive tensor, a constitutive model. And usually we use the linear one, the linear constitutive model. And this stress rate has to be objective. The one that widely used is the German stress rate. And of course, if you go to the content textbook, there are lots of objectivity stress rates, such as Trustel stress rate, convective stress rate, Grignardi stress rate, and many others. But the one that typically employ in the commercial software like Alice Dyna is German stress rate with linear constitutive model. Once you got those three equations, you're in business. Let's discretize in space using finite element method. And usually we aim for low order. So just linear function. Then if you do it, you're going to have inertia term, external force. And this external force will consist of two terms. One is the body force. One is the boundary forces, the traction. And you have this internal force. So that's very standard. So once you discretize in space, you're going to evolve in time because you do dynamics. So typically we use the standard leapfrog time integrator. So you got those three equations that you need to evolve in time in those three equations. So you evolve in velocity, the first one, you evolve the motion, the second one, and then you evolve these stress rate equations. All right, so you solve all the system. Well, do they have the shortcomings? So two shortcomings are quite obvious. So the first one is, what if you want to really go for massive giant deformations and you know that your constitute tensor here can't be linear anymore. It has to be non-linear. When I say non-linear, now your constant tensor depends on, for instance, deformation gradient tensor. If that is the case, you can't change it. The reason is because you are solving the stresses, but there is no one-to-one -one mapping in general from stresses to strength. So you always can get strength to stresses, but not the other way around, okay, in general. So if you want to go for large deformation, you need you know that the constant tensor depends on F, then you need to solve another equations to control the strength. The second thing is, which is the most important one, is the Cauchy stress tensor doesn't derive based on the strain energy function, the usual strain energy function. If that is not the case, it's very difficult to prove dissipation 
inequality, which is the second law of thermodynamics. And because of that, people tempted to move away from hypoelastic base formulation to the second option. Then the second option will be the hyperelastic base formalism. And then hyperelastic base is typically formulated in total Lagrangian formalism. Okay, so you still have the same Newton's law, but now everything you pull back and then you define at undeformed configurations. So PR represents the linear momentum defined at undeformed configuration. You have this body force, subscript R, defined at undeformed configuration. And you have this viola, first viola Kirchhoff stress tensor, this capital P. And this is a two-point tensor. What does it mean by two-point tensor? So basically it's one leg sitting at undeformed configuration. The other leg sits at the current configuration. And then you measure the stresses. And the divergence operator here, I put a capital because now this derivative is taken at undeformed configurations. So once you solve this linear moment equation, now you integrate, you obtain the motion. So those two equations is very similar to what you have seen before for hypoelastic, but it just to prove back to the undeformed configuration. The most crucial thing is I need to give you, I need to tell you how can I obtain this first piola. In hyperelastic base formalism, this piola depends on the derivative of the elastic potential energy with respect to F. So different models will have different potential energy. But with that, now you could control, you could make sure that the model that you propose will guarantee dissipation in quality. So you pass the second law. Now, the second thing is I need to tell you how I obtain my deformation gradient. So this definition, we have seen it before. So the deformation gradient is just taken from the material gradient of the mapping functions. If your F depends on the gradient of a mapping function, there is one condition they will automatically satisfy. Never need to consider, which is curve of the F that comes from the gradient of a mapping equal to zero. So when you do the classical solid dynamics equations, you never need to consider these compatibility conditions because it always automatically satisfied. Good. Now, once you got this system equation now, you want to evolve in time, you stay the same. You go for the standard leapfrog time integrator, and then the software usually tells you that when you use those equations, use the hexahedral elements. If you use the linear tetrahedral elements, which is pretty for industry, but you're going to encounter lots of numeric artifacts like volumetric locking, bending locking, pressure instability, and many others. What happens if you want to do contact or fracture? Those are the shock problems. Then you need to add some ad hoc shock viscosity, such as Laplace, or you modify the model to include viscoelastic model and try to tune the parameter to capture the shock. However, by doing this, it will affect the order of convergence of your algorithm. Let's go through the flow again, okay, step by step. You solve the linear momentum equation, you get the linear momentum, and then you divide by density, you get the velocity. Once you get the velocity, you move, you get the motion, you get the motion, you take the gradient, you get the F. Once you get the F, you get the piola, you back to the linear momentum equation. So really, the robustness of your formulations rely heavily on the resolution of the mapping function. If your mapping function is not good enough, it will affect the resolution of your strain, affect the resolution of your stress, it will affect your linear momentum equation, which is the equation of motion. So imagine that now, either you do finite element or finite volume or particle method. If I give you a mesh, which is very, very distorted, or I give you a particle method where they are clumping, together or they are very far apart. If you take the gradient, then the resolution cannot be good enough. Then it will affect the robustness of the algorithm. So now the question that we ask ourselves is, do we able to have a framework where we're able to capture shocks because we are interested in fast dynamics, something that happens very quickly. And could we move away from having F tie up with the gradient of the motion. Could we relax the constraints? 
So those are the things that, that we are trying to address. Now, if you move into the CFD community, what you see is in CFD community, there are several well-established shot capturing technologies available there. Now, the question is, could we directly go to the CFD community, bring it and put it into our formulation and then we adapt it? Um, it's not as straightforward as, as you think because the equation is different. In fluid equations, they deal with first order hyperbolic system. In our equation, we are still dealing with a wave equation, but this is second order wave equation because your primary unknown variable is the, um, is the position or is the material mapping function. So this is a wave equation, but it's second order wave equation. However, for the CFD people, that's the first order wave equation. Now, do you able to reformulate your solid equation to become a first order hyperbolic system? If you can do it, then you could go to the CFD community and bring those technology. The second thing is, I do not want my F to tie up with the geometry. Can I move away? So can I add more equation to solve it so that I move away from the map, material mapping function? All right. So once we have this now, in the next few slides is, now we know the shortcomings. Could we now propose some new formalism that can really formulate a first order hyperbolic system? But before we go into that, I would like to introduce a new algebra which will be heavily used and appear throughout this lecture. So which is called tensor cross product, which is just extension of the standard cross product. So recall that the standard cross product is, if I give you a vector V, I give you another vector W, you do a standard cross product. So that's the standard cross product. That's the initial notations. Component wise, those are the three components. So you know how to do it. So it's everything by book. Fine. Now the question is, what happens if I give you a vector? I give you a second order tensor. I want to multiply cross product. Now we are going to introduce this new notation. So it's still a cross, but now in bold font. So we call it as tensor cross product. So if I give you a vector and a second order tensor, now what I'm going to do is, that's the initial notations. Component Y is, you take the vector V, you take the first column of A, there you do the standard cross product, you place it in the first column. Now you move to the second column. You get the vector V, you take the second column of A, you do the sec standard cross product, you put it in the second column. Now you move to the last one is, you take a vector V, you take the last column of the A, you do the standard cross product, and then you end up with these entries. Okay, so that's how we define it. What happens if I give you a second order tensor A and a vector V? Now I want to do the tensor cross product. Then you do the same, but now you swap from column to row. You take the row, the first row of A, and then you take the vector of V, you do the standard cross product, now you place in the first row. You do the same. Second row will be second row of A, vector V, standard cross product, second row. Similarly, the third row of A, vector V, standard cross product, you place it here. So those are definition for tensor cross product. Now, I'll go more, okay? What happens if I give you a second order tensor another second order tensor, I want to do the tensor cross product. So you could do it. If I give you a second order tensor A, I give you a second order tensor B, the answer has to be a second order tensor, but I need to put a tensor cross product. So it's a cross with bold form. So remember, this is not the usual standard cross product. This is what we call tensor cross product. So that's the initial notation. If you want to put the component wise, this is three by three matrix. Those are the components. First column, second column, and third column. Great. So those are just mathematical algebra. Now, of course, with that definition, now you, you can start to derive some properties that you want. Let's go to some properties. So it's commutative. You got a triple scalar product. So you could start to derive lots of properties, and those are reported in our paper. But there are two properties that I need to highlight which are very, very important for large strength motion of a solid kinematics is 
the cofactor and determinant. By using this tensor cross product, now I can rewrite my cofactor of a second order tensor A as one half A cross A. And my determinant of a second order tensor, now I can rewrite it as one sixth A cross A contract with A. So up until now, you might say, but him, those are just mathematical algebra. What to do with quantum mechanics? You know, you could derive as complex as you wish. But now let's focus on these two properties and now move into quantum mechanics. So we are going to rely on those two properties that we could adapt it to the formulations that we want. Then of course, now when we talk about large deformation, we always go to the fundamental potato. So I like potato. So you got undeformed and deformed configuration. We have defined mapping function. We have defined F. So F is trying to track the fiber deformed from undeformed to deformed configuration. Now I still enhance the kinematics. What happened if I got area? What to do with the area? If I want to track how this area deform from undeformed to deformed configuration, and I'm going to use H. So I'm going to create a notation called H. And H is nothing more than the core factor of F. And that's the nonsense rule. So if I want to track how the area deformed from undeformed to deformed configuration, it rely on the notation called H, which is the area map definition. It's just core factor of the F. Now I go more. What happens if I give you an elemental volume in the undeformed configuration and I want to track how this volume expands? how this volume contract from undeformed to deformed configuration. I need to use Jacobian. And this Jacobian mathematically will be defined as determinant of F. So those are just fiber map, area map, and volume map, F, H, and J. And classically, we could define H, the core factor, the area map, as Jacobian F, minus transpose. So those are quite standard in quantum mechanics, fiber, area, volume. So you got those kinematics. But in solid dynamics, you need to take derivative. Why? You always start with energy. And now if you want to build a strong form, you take the direction derivative of those kinematic respect to virtual velocity. It will give you the strong form, you build the wing form. And also you might need to take second derivative of this kinematics to be what? To get Haitian operator for stability analysis. Or if you do finite element discretization, you need tangent operator. And those require second derivative of those kinematics. So classically, how we do it? So in my F is gradient of a mapping function. If I take the direction of derivative of F respect to virtual velocity, that's very easy. It becomes material gradient of virtual velocity. So good. If I give you a Jacobian volume, I want to take the derivative. Now you end up with this expression. And this expression is using this definition. And you can find this definition in any classical quantum mechanics book. So to have this derived is not an issue. That is perfectly fine. What happened to the core factor? Let's go to the core factor. So direction derivative of my core factor with respect to virtual velocity. What is the definition of my H? Typically is J F minus transpose. So now I got two terms. I'm going to do the product rule. I'm going to take the direction derivative of my Jacobian with respect to virtual velocity minus F minus transpose. It's here. Then I'm going to have Jacobian multiplied by direction derivative of this F minus transpose with respect to virtual velocity. I end up with here. So it's still manageable, but it doesn't look great. You got two terms, but it's fine. You, you could do it by hand. Perfect. Now, if I want to do stability analysis, oh, my tangent operator, I need second derivative. Let's go for second derivative. So the second derivative of F respect to the perturbation displacement in the current configuration, go here. Now perturb becomes zero. Perfect. You go to the Jacobian. If you want to take another direction derivative respect to H here, you could do it because you can use this result. So you got two terms. Fine. 
what happened to the area map? Let's go to the second derivative. Take the second derivative of this term with respect to the displacement. Now you got J, you got F minor transpose, you got F minor transpose. Now it's very convoluted. So you could do it. I'm sure you could do it. If you get a coffee, you get a paper, you get a pen, you're able to derive. You might fill a page, you get it done. But now it's, but it's very convoluted. And it's very difficult to extract the physical implications behind it. Can we do something simpler? Now let's go for the new tensor cross product that we define. So my core factor now is redefined as one half F cross F. And my Jacobian is one six S F cross F contract with F. Now let's do again all the algebra. I'm going to take the direction derivative in case I need strong form. I always need it. So take a direction derivative. I get this. Done. Direction of my core factor. I got this which commutative. Now I'm going to do it. I get it here. So now I got one term, but just now I got two terms because H is JF minor transpose. But because now I reformulate in the tensor cross product, it becomes a one term. Good. So there's one simplification. If I get the Jacobian, I'm going to get this term. So this is similar to the classical one. All right. If I want to check my stability, I'm going to get a second derivative. I get my second derivative of F, zero. Second derivative of my Jacobian, ah, uh, it becomes here, simple. What happens secondary of my area, my the core factor? Now, I just need to take the derivative, direction derivative of my F, respect to displacement. I end up with this. Only a term. So now you greatly simplify those algebraic manipulations that you need when they are associated to this area mapping. Now with this in place, now, good. Now let's move on to really the continued equation that we need for solid dynamics. So the equation that we need is, the first one is the linear momentum equation. That's very standard. I will start from a global form. So the rate of change of the linear momentum at undeformed configuration within the body depends on the boundary traction, the boundary forces, and the source term. And then dt is the traction. So define as first viola multiplied by the unit normal hour vector. If I do the divergence theorem from this surface integral to make it volume integral, I'm going to group them. That's my local form. So that's the standard linear moment equation that we have seen before, exactly the same. Now I need to define my piola. I'm going to do the same. I'm going to take the derivative of my energy with respect to F. I get the piola. One thing that we need to be careful is this strength energy is not convex. What does it mean? It means that the material that you put here is not very is not well posed at any state of deformations. We are dealing with solid dynamics. So we need to make sure that in your material, you always have the real wave exist at any state of your deformation. What you can't allow is you stretch your material, you have the wave speed propagate, and suddenly you stretch more and more, it becomes imaginary in terms of the model. So you can't have that. So we need to do something with this energy. The second thing is, it would be good if we're able to have a one-to-one -one mapping from stresses to strain. They will always be good if we can have it. So to address this, one possible option is now you need to use more enhanced model, mathematically called polyconvex model. So what does it mean? You are going to rewrite the energy function that depends on the classical way, material, uh, gradient of a mapping. Now you're going to rewrite in terms of multivariable energy that depends on fiber map, area map, and volume map and more importantly this energy has to be convex respect to f has to be convex respect to h has to be convex respect to j what does it mean by convex okay very simple mathematically is when you take the second derivative of this energy with respect to f it should give you a positive number with respect to h second derivative it needs to give you a positive number secondary of W with respect to J, it got to give you the positive number. So the easiest function that you could think of is, if I give a quadratic function, I put a positive sign. You take the second derivative, you are going to end up with a positive value. Or if I give you a logarithmic, 
you take twice the derivative, you end up with a negative. So you, you need to pre-multiply by negative to make it positive. Okay. So what happened to this classical Neo-Hooker model, the compressible one? Actually, they are convex. So the first one is just first invariant in C. First invariant in the right Cauchy. So the first time you could rewrite as convex respect to F because that's a corrective function with respect to F. And then mu is the shear modulus with a positive sign. So this is convex respect to F. What happened to this term? This is a quadratic function. Material properties is positive with a positive sign. So if you take the second derivative, if you give you positive, what happened to this? This is logarithmic Jacobian. You take derivative twice, this term will give you negative. You pre-multiply negative, you give you positive. So that's positive. So it's convex respect to J. Now you go more because I'm aiming for large deformations. Mooney Rifley model. So the Mooney Rifley model is just now core factor play a role, the area map. You be convex respect to F, convex respect to H because it's a quality function. And then the function of J has to be convex. And now I need to tell you those two parameters. You could calibrate when you move into the linear elasticity and you obtain alpha plus beta equal to shear modulus divided by two. If you put beta equal to zero, then you recover back to neo hooker model. So that's it's like the standard way to deal with Mooney Riffling. But now the energy becomes convex. So you guarantee that you always have the real wave speed propagating within your model at any set of deformations. So until now, you know, you got a linear moment equation that you want to solve. Now your model is well posed, but now F, H, and J, and I want to make sure that I move away. I do not want my F to type up with the mapping function. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to get a conservation equation for those geometric conservation law. When I say geometric conservation law is because those are the conservation equation to track the geometry because there's a fiber, area, and volume. So let's get the equation for the F. So F is the material gradient of a mapping function. And if you take the volume integral, and then you do the divergence theorem on this right-hand side, you end up with this surface integral. If you take time derivative, you are going to end up with this equation. So this is a global statement, meaning the rate of change of the deformation gradient within the body depends on the velocity surrounded your body at the surface. So if you do divergence theorem here, you make it to the volume integral, you group them, you are going to end up with the expressions, evolution equation for the F. So it tells you that the time derivative of the F minus divergence, velocity outer identity equal to zero. Or in other words, the time derivative of F equals to material gradient of a velocity. They are the same. What happened to my Jacobian? Now I'm going to borrow things that I know from fluid. In fluid, we know that it has to be in current configuration. The change of the current volume depends on the velocity surrounded the boundary, but defined at deformed configuration. I'm going to do the pullback, this expression. Then I'm going to do the divergence theorem and I end up with the local form. That's another conservation equation for my Jacobian. So the time degree of my Jacobian minus divergence H transpose velocity, everything goes to zero. So I got F conservation equation. I got J conservation equation. Now, what happens if I want to go for my area map? Let's get the equation. And it's not easy to get the conservation equation for this term. So the H now, because I redefine as one half F cross F. So with the use of the tensor cross product, if this is the case, if I want to get a time derivative, then it's very simple because the time derivative is nothing more than you take the direction derivative of your h with respect to velocity. If you do that, that will be the expression that I previously shown to you, which is f tensor cross product gradient of a velocity is, a, is one term. And what you need to do is now you put the volume integral, you do the divergence theorem, you are going to end up with this global expression, one within the volume, one within the surface, 
And if you want to get the local form, you are going to end up with these expressions. So the derivative of the area map minus curve V tensor cross product deformation gradient equal to zero. You can always rewrite curve as a divergence by playing the fluxes here. So that is fine. So up until now, we have one linear moment equation. We have three geometric conservation equation. Let's put all these equations together. Let's see how it looks. So we got a linear moment equation to track the equation of motion. And then we have three geometric conservation equation. It's try to track the fiber, map the area, and the volume. Because now we have quite a bit of redundant auxiliary variables. So we need to put, we need to have some compatibility conditions. So mathematically, they call it as involutions. So because my F now doesn't come from the gradient of a mapping function, it's no longer anymore because I solve it. So when I solve my F, I have to guarantee that curve of the F equal to zero. If you do in the classical way, you never need to worry about this term because your F is based on the gradient of a mapping function. But if I solve my F here, I need to make sure that curve F, it has to be zero. Similarly, if I decided to include core factor the area map as my unknown variable, if I solve it, I got to make sure that the divergence of the edge has to be zero. So basically, if divergence of the curve, they have to be zero mathematically. Okay. Now, of course, I need to model. So the Piola now has to depend on F, H, and J. So if you look at this equation, you could find some similarities. Those are the unknown variables with the time derivative. I could rewrite curve as divergence. So you got all these divergence operator at undefined configuration. And then you got some fancy components here, which is fine. That equals to some term. So now I'm going to redefine my variables. I'm going to say I'm going to have my unknown variables. Now consists of lots of unknown variables, which is linear momentum, F, H, and J. And now my fluxes is here. My source term, if I define in this manner, I'm going to group them together. I'm going to rewrite them as first order hyperbolic system. So this is the first order hyperbolic system of equation. The time derivative of unknown variable plus divergence of the fluxes equal to source term. So if you come from solid mechanics community, you might not familiar with these expressions. However, if you come from CFD community, this is the equations that you have been dealing over and over again. If you look at the Navier-Stokes equations, Euler equations, this is the mathematical equations that they are dealing with. And now, once you got this hyperbolic system, you're in business. So now you could start to borrow CFD technology, especially shock capturing technology, then you bring it to the solid dynamics equation. Now the aim is now you could bridge the gap between computational fluid dynamics and computational solid dynamics. Second advantage is now you do not need to restrict yourself to any discretization technique because you could do you could move away from standard final element method. You could go now go to Stepteller Garlakin, Petrov Garlakin, this constant Garlakin. You could even go for finite volume vertex based cell-based particle methods like smooth particle hydrodynamics methods because those schemes were heavily developed in the CFD community and they are very well in capturing shocks. All right. So once we got the system, there is one thing that I haven't really discussed is I got a piola typically depends only on F, but now I got F, H, and J. I need to somehow relate these stresses. So the next slide will be I need to somehow relate my piola to those three geometric measures that I just introduced. How am I going to do it? First is I'm going to define the conjugate stresses. So this is just a definition. I just define the variable. I'm going to call sigma f, which is the stresses associated to f. The definition will be the derivative of my energy with respect to f. I do the same. I go for the sigma h which is the stresses associated with the area map. The definition will be derivative 
of the energy with respect to H. Now, I move to sigma J, which is the conjugate stresses with respect to Jacobian, defined as the derivative of the energy function with respect to J. So that's just the definition. Now, I need to make sure that my piola somehow relate to those three conjugate stresses that I need because I can always compute it. If you give me the explicit expressions for this energy that I can do it by hand, I will give you the expression for sigma h, sigma f, sigma h, and sigma j. Now let's try to relate them. If I want to relate to the first piola with those three conjugate stresses, I'm going to use the internal work. So that's very standard. So the piola contract with the time derivative of the f. And this is identical to the time derivative of the classical strain energy that depends on the gradient of a mapping function. That's standard. Now, I know that I do not use this. I use a convex multivariable. So I'm going to replace this phi with W. And then argument will be F, H, and J. And now I need to do the time derivative. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the chain rule. So I'm going to take the chain rule with respect to F, with respect to H, with respect to J. And now I'm going to substitute the definition. What is this term? Sigma F, boom. Sigma H, depth. Sigma J, boom. And more importantly, oops. And then this time derivative of F, time derivative of H, time derivative of J, they are my conservation equation. And I know the expression. So I substitute one by one. And then I'm going to group them which is this term. Now I'm going to compare the term on the left, the term on the right. So what is this? This is just my piola. So now I able to relate, I able to get an expression to relate the piola and those three conjugate stresses that I got, which is sigma F, sigma H, sigma J. Of course, with some strain measure F and J and this tensor cross product. So if you look at this, actually it's beautiful. So that's the definition that won't change. What will change would be the definition of sigma f, sigma h, and sigma j. So when you do the implementation, you do not change the structure. You only change the way you define sigma f, sigma h, and sigma j because that depends on model. Now, let me give you one example. So let's go for the Mooney Rupi model. So in traditional way, what you do is the standard energy for the Mooney Rivley depends on the material gradient of a mapping. Then equals to the capital C here is the right Cauchy. The right Cauchy it means F transpose F. Okay, so that is the first invariant, the first term. Then the second term will be the second invariant of C, and then the third term depends on Jacobian. So that's the standard way. Now it's not convex, but I'm going to rewrite this term. So I need to make sure that whatever I do here, it has to be expressed in terms of F, H, and J. So let's go term by term. So the first term, first, uh, this is the first invariant of right Cauchy. I could rewrite it as F contract with F. So now this is a correlative function for the F. So it's convex with respect to F. Second invariance of C, I could rewrite this term as correlative function of the H. So it's convex. Okay, so convex with respect to H. And then this function of J is already convex. So I'm going to renew it. I'm going to renew it as F, but this term will be exactly the same. So now I just rewrite term by term, but now it becomes a convex energy. So the material is well posed. So once I got the energy, I could obtain my conjugate stresses, sigma F, sigma H, and sigma J. So I'll go one by one. So sigma F will be the derivative of W with respect to F. It's a correlative function. So 2 alpha F. I'm going to take the, what happened to this conjugate stresses with respect to H. is the derivative of the energy with respect to H. So this term only involves H. Quadratic 2 beta H. Sigma J will be the derivative for the energy with respect to J. And only the one in blue with respect to J. So you get it. So once you got this sigma f, sigma h, and sigma j, you just need to go to this magic expression for the piola. So the piola will be sigma f plus sigma h tensor cross product f. 
then plus sigma j multiplied by h. So the good thing is, again, if you change the model here, you change those three components. Okay. So another thing that becomes interesting is I need to get one-to-one -one mapping between stresses and strain. So imagine that now I got sigma f respect to f. So if I know the value of sigma f, I divide by 2 alpha, I get the strain. So if I give you the stress, I can obtain strain, one-to-one -one mapping. Go to here. If you have sigma h, you divide by 2 beta. You have h. So stresses, now it's one-to-one -one mapping from stresses to strain. It's because those materials now can be inverted. The constant relations can be inverted because of the polyconvex model. Right. So now we got the full system equation. Now we know that the model is well posed. We always need to build a big form. When we build a big form, um, we got to be careful because now I got four equation. They are different units. I got linear momentum equation, the real of the linear momentum equation. Okay, that is different unit. And then I got three geometric conservation law. If I want to build a single weak statement, I need to pre-multiply by the proper conjugate field. And eventually I know that I need to pass the second law. So I need to make sure that I have, for instance, linear momentum equation. If I pre-multiply by something, it has to give me energy unit. And then the rest of the geometric conservation equation, if you pre-multiply by some variables, it has to give me energy units. If I sum them up, that will be the total energy that I could prove the second law. So for me, it's important to build a big form. I need this proper conjugate because now I got the last system of equations. So in order to do this, I need to introduce Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonian in isothermal process is nothing more than total energy, which is the summation of kinetic energy and elastic potential energy. And of course, now my Hamiltonian is convex because the kinetic energy is always convex because it's quadratic function with a positive sign. If my model is already polyconvex, I can guarantee that my Hamiltonian is always convex. That is good, okay? So once I know my Hamiltonian is well-defined, if I'm interested in the conjugate field with respect to all my equation, I'm going to take the derivative of the Hamiltonian respect to each and every unknown components that I got. And I'm going to call this V as conjugate field. So let's component by component. So the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to my first unknown is the linear momentum. You go there, you work it out, it becomes velocity. So what does it mean? It means that you take your first equation, linear momentum equation, if you pre-multiply by velocity, it will give you energy unit. And actually that will be kinetic energy. If you go to the second component, the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to F, if you do that, you are going to end up with this conjugate stresses, sigma F. So now, if you take my second equation, the geometric equation, the fiber map, you pre-multiply by sigma F, it will give you an energy unit. And actually, that will be part of the elastic stress energy associated to F. Then you do the same. Then you end up with sigma H and sigma J. Okay, so now I have a proper conjugate field with respect to those four equations that I'm considering. Now, I want to check my Hessian operator. I know it's convex, but let's check it. So it has to be positive definite. So I'm going to get my Hessian operator of my Hamiltonian will be second derivative of my Hamiltonian with respect to my unknown variable. This will be equivalent to the derivative of my conjugate with respect to unknown variable. So the first one is the velocity. My first unknown variable is linear momentum. That is the relation through one divided by density. That if I go to divide this is zero because the derivative of velocity with respect to the rest of my unknown, f, h, and j, they are not related because they are separate variables, zero. And then if I take the derivative of this sigma f, sigma h, sigma j, with respect to my first unknown, which is the linear momentum, they are not related they are zeros. If you take the derivative of those three components with respect to F, H, and J, you end up with another massive Hessian operator here, highlighted in red. That's the definition. And we know that this guy has to be convex because the model itself is polyconvex. If you use muni rivlin model, there you go. Very simple. You get a diagonal. You get a two alpha 
fourth order tensor identity to beta fourth order tensor, and then the second derivative of f respect to Jacobian. Alpha and beta, they are material properties, so they always give you positive value. Then the second derivative, it has to be positive because it's convex with respect to J. If you put them together, now for Mundi Riffle model, your Haitian operator for this Hamiltonian is just a diagonal. That's beautiful. There's no diagonal, it's diagonal. Now, with this Haitian operator, can be inverted because if you are to invert, everything is positive. You just invert directly. And there is one thing very important if you allow this to be inverted. Because now I could give you another set of equations, but now not written in linear momentum f, h, and j as my unknown. I'm going to re give you another unknown, which is my conjugate velocity and stresses. So I could give you another set of equations. It's the same formulation, but it's just diff different unknown variables. How can I do it? Recall that this is the conservation equation. The divergence of the fluxes, I'm going to keep the same. Source term, I'm going to keep the same. And the time derivative of my unknown variable, I'm going to use the chain rule. So it's going to be the derivative of my unknown with respect to conjugate, then conjugate time derivative. What is the term in this square bracket? It's just the inverse of the Haitian. And this can always be inverted, all right? Because I just showed you, at least for military model. Now you multiply across, you end up with this expression. So now, what is conjugate? So the conjugate is velocity, sigma f, sigma h, and sigma j. You know the Hesher operator, you know the fluxes, you know the soft term. For mooney Rifley model, that will be the equations that you can deal with. So this is the linear moment equation, but now rewrite in terms of velocity as unknown. Initially, you got f as unknown, now becomes stresses. So now you could end up with velocity as unknown and the stresses as unknown in your equation. But those two formulations are the same. Now, it's a preference whether you stick with the conservation variable that I just mentioned to you, which is linear momentum, F, H, and J, or some people prefer to use velocity and the stresses, those three stresses. And those two will be identical mathematically at the continuum level. Okay. Um, to summarize this first hour lecture, I know that it's a bit heavy, all right? So the first thing is, First is I have introduced why we need the tensor cross product. So the tensor cross product can greatly simplify the algebra manipulation associated with the area map. Then we indeed can derive a first order hyperbolic system for solid dynamics. And when we use the polyconvex model, we can guarantee there will be the real wave exists at any state of deformation. And we can also guarantee there is one-to-one -one mapping between stresses and strains. Then I introduce Hamiltonian because I need my proper conjugate. And then I present the two variants of the same formulation. It just depends on different unknowns. One is conservation-based, one is the conjugate fields. And then with that, you could explore any standard CFD discretization techniques that you want. And it should work, all right. So, thanks. That that's all for the at least first part of my talk. Um, in the first hour of my lecture, so I have introduced um a new system of first order conservation law for solid dynamics, and the unknown variables are linear momentum, the fiber map, the area map, and the volume map, and then I have the model that is well posed. Now, in this second hour of the lecture, then for ease of understanding, I'll go from 3D, now reduce everything into 1D. Okay? So in terms of the conservation equation now, you no longer need the area map because there's no area anymore. You no longer need the volume map. You only got the linear momentum equations as well as the fiber map equation, but a reduced version because it's 1D. Once we got the equations, then I will check the hyperbolicity or the wave speed. Because as I said in the first lecture is, I need to always guarantee the existence of real wave speed. And here I'm going to show you how to obtain the wave speed and it has to be real all the time because of the values. 
Then after that, before moving into the uh, final elements uh, discretizations, I need to build a brick form. I will start with the standard one, the standard garlicine, which people call Boot of Garlicine, the brick form. And then I'll move on further, I'll start to modify it, and then we'll go to the stabilized brick form, which people call it as Petro Garlicine uh, statement. Then after that, I'm going to provide a relations between petrogolokine and variational multiscale approach. What does it mean by variational multiscale? And actually, they are the same in the linear elasticity. Then once we got the big form sorted, we are going to move on to final element discretization. And again, in this hour, I will only focus on the simplest possible final element shear function, discretization. So I'm only go for is 1D, so it's two node linear shear functions. So I will always go for uh, low order linear shear functions, lean, a very simple one. And then once it discretize in space, they will evolve in time using explicit time integrator. Now let us see the equations. So in 1D now, we know that we only have a linear moment equation and we only have Give me one sec. Spotlight. Oops. There you go. So we have a linear moment equation and the F equation. Let's focus on the linear moment equations. So a little bit of notations because now it's in 1D. So only in X directions. So my linear momentum in 3D, I have three components. Now I'm going to reduce it to one component. So it's going to be linear momentum. I put the subscript X is because it's in the X directions. All right. Now I'm going to have divergence of the piola. In 1D, it's just the derivative of the piola with respect to X. So this X is no longer in both form because it's just in 1D. And I got a piola that depends on my F. And this piola is only one component in 3D. You got nine components because it's three by three matrix. And in 1D, I only take the first component, which is P, X, little X and capital X. It's a two-point answer. So I put a distinction between the X and capital X. And it depends on F, because that's the model. That equals to a body force. Again, it's a scalar. So F subscript X. And then the linear momentum equal to density multiplied by velocity in the X direction. It's a single component. Okay, good. So it's one equation, single component for linear momentum. Let's go for the geometric conservation equations. So in 3D, you have nine components. But now in 1D, you got one component. So the first component. So you got F, X, and capital X. That's a scalar. And then minus gradient of velocity. In 1D, it becomes the derivative of the velocity, a scalar, with respect to capital X. And of course, this velocity, I try to emphasize that it depends on linear momentum. So they are coupled. So the first equation depends on F. The second equation depends on the first equation. So those are just arguments. That equals to zero. So now we got those two equations in 1D. So the second one probably is something new to you because that's the equation to track fiber. We are interested in solid dynamics. So mathematically is initial boundary value problems. So we need to have appropriate initial conditions. We need to have appropriate boundary conditions. And apart from that, we need to close the system with appropriate constitutive flow. Again, to demonstrate this, I'll use the simplest possible constant model in solid mechanics, which is linear elasticity that you everyone familiar with. So I'm going to have my piola, the stresses, equals to capital E represents the Young's modulus multiplied by strain. And strain can be written as F minus 1. Again, it's just a scalar component. So this system of equation with this model, because we are in this demonstration is linear elasticity, so small strain, and we call it as linear elastodynamics. Now, of course, when you move into the small strain, there is no need to make a distinction between little x and a capital X, because back to those two potatoes, you got to undeform, you got to deform. But when you got a small strain, this deformed potato actually coincides with this undeformed one. So indeed, there is no need to distinguish make a distinction between little x and capital X. However, in this hour lecture, because I try to be consistent with my previous lecture, I'm going to put distinction little x and capital X, okay? 
And of course, this piola can be considered as Koshi because it will be the same. So once you got this first order conservation law, how are you going to put them together? Let me know. So we know that I'm in for a first order hyperbolic system. A little notation. So I'm going to have unknown variable with a little x here because it's 1D. And then I have divergence fluxes. Then my fluxes, the x is in 1D. And then I got my source term, little x, so emphasize in 1D. Look at my components. So my unknown variable now, I only have two components. One component is for the linear momentum equation. The other component is for F, the variable, the, the fiber that I saw. And then I got the fluxes, two components. I got a source term, two components. So it's pretty straightforward. It's a system of equations with only two unknowns in 1D, of course. Now, I got this system of equation. Now, it seems everything is correct. How do I know that this is well-defined? As I said before, I need to make sure that there always be a real waste speed exists. So I need to check the eigenvalues, which is the waste speed. And I need to check the eigenvector, which is the direction of the waste speed for this system of equations. So let's try to proceed. So mathematically, if you want to prove the waste speed eigenvalues or the direction of the waste speed eigenvectors, we are going to rewrite this term into a quasi-linear representations which is the following. The time that we have unknown variable, I'm going to keep it. Source term, I'm going to keep it. Now, this derivative of the fluxes, I know my fluxes depends on my unknown variables, and unknown variable certainly depends on space x. So I'm going to, take to, uh, I'm going to do the chain rule. So the derivative of the fluxes respect to unknown variable multiplied by the derivative of unknown variable with respect to x. Now, I'm going to rename variable. So the derivative of the fluxes respect to unknown variable, I'm going to call it as A. And from now onwards, I will call this A as flux Jacobian matrix. And if your fluxes, you got two components, your unknown variable, you got two components. If you take the derivative, you only end up with a matrix with two by two matrix. So it's only with this size. All right. So let's go the component one by one slowly. So I have one one component will be derivative of my fluxes with respect to my unknown variable. My fluxes piola depends only on f. So derivative of piola with respect to my first unknown variable. If I move to one two components, which is going to be derivative of my fluxes with respect to my second unknown variable f. Let's go to to one component. So the fluxes velocity. And then with respect to my unknown variable, first one. Then two, two components will be the fluxes, second components, respect to my second unknown variable f as x. So this is the structure. Let's try to fill this. My piola depends only on f. It doesn't depend on leading momentum. So if you take derivative, boom, zero. Go to another diagonal. You got a velocity and then f. They are two separate variables. They don't talk, zero. Now I move to these two one components. You got a velocity, you got a linear momentum. What is the relations? Density. You got it here. And this is the interesting block. So if you look at this component, what do you see? The derivative of the piola with respect to F. And this is the constitutive relations. And in this case, we are dealing with linear elasticity. And if you do that, it's just the Young's modulus. Now, you can start to imagine that even in 1D, you start to go for a Nihoku model that potentially depends on deformation gradient F. It's no longer be a constant value. It could be something that depends on F. So it gets quite complicated, complicated as you increase the nonlinearity of the elastic model. Okay, why this is important? So physically, this flux recovery matrix encapsulates all the necessary informations related to waste speed and the direction of the waste speed. So if you want to know the waste speed and the direction of the waste speed, what you need to do is you need to go to this flux matrix A, and then you need to find, you need to do the eigen decomposition for these A's. So you need to find eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Then 
you able to find the explicit expressions for the wave speed and you need to check that whether at any step of deformation you always have the speed propagating within your model so the next slide will be i need to find eigenvalues eigenvectors or i need to find eigenvalues because i need to find the wave speed how can i do it it's very standards so i'm going to inspect the possible solution in the plane wave phase solutions so the unknown variables that I want to solve two components in 2D, I'm going to do like, I'm going to must emit two separate functions. One will be a scalar function that depends on space, depends on time, depends on wave speed, and then multiply by a non-zero constant vector. Okay, and put a bar. So it can be any, any values. So it'll be P bar, F bar, because I'm solving two equations. Once I have this expression, now I know that I somehow need to pass through the uh, quasi-linear representation. So I need to take derivative. So let's take the derivative first, one by one. I'm going to take the derivative of my unknown variable with respect to time. Now, this u bar is just a constant vector. Doesn't depend on space, doesn't depend on time. Put it here. And then this scalar function here depends on space and depends on time. If I want to take the time derivative, I'm going to take the derivative of f respect to this argument and then multiply by the derivative of this argument with respect to time. It will give me minus c alpha. Boom. There you go. You got this term. Now you go further. If I want to take the derivative of my unknown variable with respect to x, what will you do? You will bar here, you keep the same. And then you take the derivative of f respect to the argument, which is called f prime. And then you take the derivative of the argument with respect to space, give you one. So one. You got those two expression now, revisit back this quasi-linear representation, which is here. The time derivative of unknown variable plus flux Jacobian matrix multiplied by derivative of the unknown with respect to x equals to zero. If you substitute those two expressions, rearrange them, you are going to end up with these expressions. And for non-trivial solutions, then this cannot be zero. So now you need to force this term to be zero. And what is this? This is just a classical dynamic problem to obtain eigenvectors, eigenvalues. And again, this A is just two by two components because it's 1D. So if you want to make sure that this equals to zero, and this is a non-constant vector, so the only thing is the determinant of the matrix within this parenthesis they have to be zero. And this is two by two components. So the answer, you got two answers, one positive, one negative. Okay. So you could do it if you go into that route, but I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to use this expression. and I just do the substitutions. I know that the structure of my A's, which is here. So that's the structure of my fluxual matrix. So I know this. I know my U, which is there, and that I identity, identity tensor, and then I go to expand it. So I end up with two equations, two unknowns, and I can solve it. So do the substitution, substitute the first one, do the second one, you end up with this expression. And now what you do is, this is P bar, P bar, we remove it. You are aiming for CL4. So move density to the left. So it's Young's modulus divided by density equals to square. So square root plus minus. So you have two solutions. So you got two different wave speeds. One traveling positive to the right. One traveling negative to the left. But the most important thing is the CP in this case, because it's 1D, so there's no pressure wave. So it has to be, uh, there's no shear wave. It has to be pressure wave in 1D. So CP represents the pressure wave. And look at the definition. The definition is just square root Young's modulus divided by density. And the Young's modulus, always positive. There's material properties. Density, positive. So the square root here is always a real number. And now, interesting thing comes the picture. If you go for non-linear elastic model, you no longer depends on Young's modulus. It depends on some nasty expression, but depends on deformation gradient. Now, you got to make sure that regardless of stretch that you put there, when you take the square root, it always gives you a real number. It's very difficult unless you do polyconvex model. 
if you use polyconvex model, you always guarantee that this CP, the value is always real. That's important because what you don't want is when you run the solid dynamics formulation, you got a wave propagating and then suddenly the wave, you can't compute. And, and it's not because of your finite element discretization or the numerical scene, no. It's just the model itself, it's just not well posed. So you got to fix the model because we haven't discretized anything. This depends on the constitutive model. So with that now, the CP, if you stretch linear elasticity, of course, now the CP is always give you a real number. So this is the equation that I just presented tells you that this linear elasticity, um, the CP is always real. So you always guarantee that there will be a waste speed propagating right and left. So imagine that you've got two bodies impact. Then at the contact point in 1D, you always have a wave propagate to the right. At the same time, there's another wave propagate to the left. Why? Why you got those two waves propagating? Because in 1D, you got two solutions for the wave. All right. So now you got an equation. 1D is a very reduced system. You got a model, linear elasticity, and actually it's well posed because you guarantee the existence of real wave speed. Now, I need to build a weak form. Again, when I build, build a weak form, I, I always tempted to have an appropriate conjugate field. So I'm going to do is, I'll go to the same. I'm going to get my Hamiltonian, but not in 1D. So very interesting. Everything gets simplified. So I get to my Hamiltonian. Again, isotherma, in this case, will be total energy. So with summation of kinetic energy and elastic potential energy. So that's quality function with a positive sign. So it's convex with respect to P. And this has to be convex with respect to F because look at the mod, it's quality function for this linear elastic model. So once I got this Hamiltonian, I take the derivative, I should get the conjugate. So let's do the same, but not in 1D. So only two components. So derivative of H, Hamiltonian, with respect to my first component of my unknown, which is linear momentum. You work it out, boom, velocity. Second component, you take the derivative of Hamiltonian respect to F, which is the model, you get viola. So what does it mean? So now, if you take your first conservation equation, linear momentum, multiply by velocity, now it gives you energy unit. That is kinetic energy. And now you could plus the second conservation equation that you're considering, which is the time rate of the F, you pre-multiply by viola, that will give you the strain energy. If you put them together, that's the total energy. And you want to make sure that you, know, you can check the second law and things like that. So this conjugate, it's quite important if you got a separate equation and now you want to put them into a single statement because they always have different units. So once we got this conjugate properly defined, let's move on to the Haitian. Let's check the Haitian. And I know it has to be post definite. So I can invert it because that's convex function. So I'm going to take the second derivative of Hamiltonian with respect to u. I'm going to do the same, okay? But now in 1D will be only those two by two matrix. So I'm going to take the derivative of velocity with respect to my first unknown linear momentum. So the relation is density. One, two component will be the derivative of the velocity with respect to my second unknown, which is f. They are not relating, zero. 2, 1 component will be the derivative of the piola with respect to my first unknown, uh, linear momentum. No, zero. And then the last term will be the derivative of the piola with respect to my second unknown, F. And this is the model, E. So if you look at my Hessian operator, it, it is diagonal, fine. But if you look at the entries, they are all positive. Density, positive. Young's modulus, positive. So you could invert very easily. If you can invert very easily, I'm going to follow the same procedure that I just mentioned. Now, let's try to get the dual set of equation if I want. So, I'm, so this equation, you've seen it before. I put a little x here because now everything becomes 1D. So you only got two components. If you substitute those definitions, Hessian operator, and fluxes and source term that I defined previously, you end up with this equation. So again, this is the equation of motion, but now it's just rewritten in terms of velocity. This is the equation we read in terms of Piola. Why this equation becomes interesting? The reason is because in solid mechanics, we tempted to deal with linear momentum energy. 
strain measured. However, for CFD community, they attempted to solve for velocity and the stresses like pressure because they want to fulfill incompressibility. So sometimes it's good to provide the same equation, but for two different unknowns. So that depends on what sort of equations that you would like to attack, that you can select. However, in this talk, I will not present two. I will back to the solid mechanics. So I'll stick with the first one, where my unknown will be linear momentum and F, but only two components in 1D, okay? So once I got this proper conjugate, I need to build the weak form. Let's build the weak form. Let's go for the standard one. So standard Galakin or something called as button of Galakin. I'm going to do slightly different, okay? First, because I got two equations, I'm going to define my residual. So my residual will be two components, residual of my first equation, residual of my second equation. So that's my linear moment equation. That's my F equation. They have to be zero because that's residual because you are solving it. And then in a compact manner, I could write in this manner. Residual equals to the tangent rate of U plus divergence of the fluxes minus source term equal to zero. So it's the same. You just write in a compact manner without showing those two components. Now, I want to build a weak form. So how am I going to do it? So I'm going to take this residual, which is my governing equation. I'm going to pre-multiply by a proper conjugate field that I know. And I know that if I multiply them, I take the volume integral, the average has the zero. So I have two equations. I multiply by two uh, conjugate, a proper conjugate, and I'm going to sum them. It becomes a single equation. And I put the volume integral, the half to be zero. So mathematically, it will be, that is my residual. I pre-multiply by the proper conjugate field. You put the volume integral, that will be zero. And you should have the energy units. So now you could quantify whether it's stable or not. If you want, you do some stability check, like Lyapunov, things like that. Now, from here, let's start to expand it. So I'm going to keep this term on the left. I'm going to move these two terms to the right. And moreover, I'm going to do the divergence theorem to the integration by parts on these fluxes. So I bring the surface integral. So you have a first term on the right, which is the inertia effect. So in the last two days, we do not see this because we are not dealing with dynamics. But now, this is the time variation. So this term is the inertia. And now you have the first term on the right. That is the internal virtual work because that's the volume integral. And then you have the external virtual work. So external virtual work consists of the boundary and the source term. But again, now everything is in 1D. So this is a single statement. But now, because I got virtual velocity and virtual viola, I'm going to consider separate variation for virtual velocity and virtual viola. So eventually, I could end up with two separate weak forms. So one weak form for the linear moment equations and one weak form for this new geometric conservation equations. So let's go one by one. Let's go for the first equation. That's the linear moment equation weak form. And this is nothing new. If you start with solid dynamics, displacement base, you're familiar with this because it's exactly the same. So the first one on the left, inertial virtual work. And then the first one on the right, internal virtual work. And then you've got the boundaries, which is the boundary tractions or the forces. And then you've got the source term. So that's very, very standard. Things might be different is because I add this geometric conservation equation, but now look at the weak form. So I'm going to have the left-hand side, which is the type variation of the F. And then I have this internal contribution. And I potentially could have boundary contribution that depends on the velocity. Okay. So now I got two weak forms. You might say that, oh, I'm in business. Let's discretize. So if you decided to go for linear functions, finite element, and you use the lammas, if you discretize in these two weak forms, if you try to solve the solid dynamics equation, the wave equation, then suddenly everything becomes unstable. So meaning it runs perfectly initially, then you start to have wiggles and wiggles who grow and just can't control it. Why is that? It's because when you do linear shape function with a lab mass at the interior node, if you start with the standard bottom garlicking, eventually end up with central difference approximation, which I will discuss in a minute. So what is central difference approximation is if you are here, 
you are going to update using information on the left, using information on the right. You update this guy. That's central difference. But for the wave equation, you need to be careful. So imagine now the wave is propagating from my left to the right. If you want to update this guy, you need to make sure that you use the correct information. Actually, you need to use the correct information, information based on the upwinding direction. You need to use as less information coming from the downstream. You need to minimize it, okay? So if you use a central difference, you can't because you use equal weighting. That's why it becomes unstable. So you need to move into some upwinding technology that try to take into account this upwinding direction of the flow. If you want to update properly, then that's the reason why people tended to develop these. And there was a technique in 80s called petrov garlikin So what petrov garlikin trying to do is now, he's going to perturb this conjugate field. What he's going to do? So he tried to perturb the conjugate field such that you would take more weightings coming from the upwind and then less weighting for the downstream. So now they are going to perturb the weighting function. But of course, when you perturb the weighting function, you need to take into account what? Take into account the wave speed and the wave speed direction because you need to know where is the wave coming from. You need to know the direction. And hopefully by doing that, you're able to shift all your conjugate more shifting into those directions that you need. So when you do the update, it becomes stable. So mathematically now is in petrov galakin now we are going to redefine, we are going to perturb such that we are going to call it as stabilized virtual field. And this stabilized virtual field will be the standard virtual field plus some perturbation. So again, this perturbation is trying to shift the shape to the outwinding direction. And look at these terms carefully because you want to take into account the outwind directions. So tau is just a step stabilizing parameter. In this case, we just stick with diagonal, simple one. So we've got two parameters and they have to be greater or equal to zero. And then the most important thing is this flux Jacobi matrix. Because remember, this flux Jacobi matrix consists of all necessary information related to wave speed and direction of wave speed because eigenvalues, eigenvector, we just show it. And now uh, you need to have a derivative of virtue with respect to x. And if you put tau equal to zero, now, suddenly your petrov galakin move back to butnov galakin which in the simplest possible case that I just mentioned, you make it to the central difference again, which becomes unstable. So the, by modifying this uh, virtual field, which we call stabilized virtual field, and this method is called streamline upwind petrov galakin method. Again, it, has been, it was developed back in 1982 in fluid community. Okay, now, once we got this new definition of stabilized conjugate work field, let's build a weak form. Let's do the same. Let's follow the procedure. So if I want to build a weak form, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a residual pre-multiplied by the stabilized virtual field. And then put a volume integrate everything to be zero. So I'm going to follow the way that I do the like Budnov Galakin. Now I'm going to substitute this definition in there. I got two terms. So I end up with the first term and the one that I highlighted in red which is the stabilization, the extra term, all right? Now, let's try to expand this Putnam Galakin. So this Putnam Galakin, I've shown you before, it can be expanded as initial virtual work, internal virtual work, and external virtual work. Let's, let's expand it. So when expand it, you end up with internal virtual work, initial virtual work, external, and internal. So those four terms we've seen it before, just Putnam Galakin, okay, nothing fancy. But what's interesting is now you add additional term here. And this is SUPG stabilization, which is the perturbation from petrov -Golikin. And you are perturbed within the volume integral. That's cool because that's the external virtual work. I'm going to put this in. I got an internal virtual work. I got a perturbation in the internal virtual work. Now, if you look at the structure, oops, they are the same. Now, group them. I'm going to group them. So I'm going to have this term, which I highlighted in parentheses. I'm going to call as stabilized flux. Okay. So now you are perturbating the fluxes in the volume integral when you do the SUPG. And now the F stabilized, the definition will be the stabilized, the fluxes that you obtain usually, then plus something else. This something else 
will be flux flow matrix, then the stabilization parameter and the residual. Why this is interesting? Because remember, this additional term, this stabilization, depends on residual. So you ensure consistency because there are lots of standard solid dynamics formulation is you know that you are dealing with the wave problem, you need to add viscosity. So you add it, but you will lose the convergence. But if you add a term that based on the residual, you're in business. As you refine, this guy should go to zero quickly than the, the other term. So you will not affect the order of convergence. So that's the beauty of SUPG approach. Once you got this one, let's particularize to the expressions that we want. So I'm going to have stabilized velocity. I'm going to have stabilized piola. Okay, so I just particularize the expression that I want. Now I want to build a weak form. So I'll go for component by component. So I'm going to have the residue of my linear moment equation pre multiplied by stabilized velocity. That will give you the energy unit plus my residue of my second equation pre multiplied by the step by stabilized piola. That will give me the energy unit. Now I could put them together, put the integral, everything becomes zero. Once I do that, I substitute in there and then I consider different variation for virtual velocity and virtual polar. Then I end up with two weak form. So let's go one by one. The first weak form, the linear momentum. So the linear momentum will be exactly the same as bootnov galakin exactly the same that you see. The only difference is now it's polar stabilized. Just now what you saw is polar. So really the change is very minor from the standard to this new formalism. Okay, so you, you modify this pure law, but it's volume integrated, it's fine. It's not related to the interface. You go to the second equation here, which is the new your geometric conserver equation. Now, again, it looks exactly the same as what I presented previously for bootnov galakin The difference is now, instead of velocity, now velocity stabilized. Let's go to the component. How do they look like? So my pure law stabilized equals to the standard pure law they obtain plus some stabilization. And this stabilization involve Young's modulus, involve parameter, involve residual. Then my velocity stabilized will be velocity plus something else that involve stabilizing parameter and residual. And usually when we run a simulation, we do not add any stabilization to the F equation. We only add stabilization to the near moment equation because equation of motion, because the first equation really you track the motion. So you need to do a better job in that. Now, you might think that, oh, with that, let's discretize. No, hang on a sec. There's there something bothering me very much. You got a piola. That you, so there's this additional contribution for the piola. It depends on the constitutive model. I mean, for linear elasticity, it's fine. That's young spoilers, I understand that. But if I go for non-linear elastic model, this might be very convoluted. Of course, again, if you do it by hand, I'm sure that you could do it, but can we simplify this? Can I, can I have a stabilization not part of my fluxes? Because my fluxes will be the stresses that depends on the constant model. Can I part of my unknown variable? Can you just rewrite things and move around? And hopefully we could do something else. So that's why people call it as VMS approach. Let's see what are they. So I'm going to rewrite things. So the first line is the same. Piola stabilized equal to Piola plus destabilization, what I presented before, but involve Young's modulus, okay? Good. Uh, what is my Piola definition? Young's modulus multiplied by strain. Substitute in there. This term remains the same. Now I'm going to group it. So I got Young's modulus. I got Young's modulus. I'm going to group them. And then minus one. And then I'm going to call this term within my parenthesis here. I'm going to call it as F stabilized. And then I could rewrite as piola that depends on F stabilized. And what is F stabilized? Will be F plus some perturbation. This perturbation now depends on stabilizing parameter and the residual. So what is the why is this important? Because now instead of perturb the piola, the fluxes that depends on the constant model, you perturb your unknown variable. And you always can get the close one solution or expression by if you pass me the F, I'll pass the piola. Now you just pass me F stabilized. I use the same expression, I pass you P. 
pure loss stabilized. So now it's much more convenient because you do not go through this constant model. However, this is only correct mathematically identical when you have linear elasticity. Of course, if you go for non-linear elasticity, this becomes approximations because it's no longer the same, identical. But now let's try to go for more general expressions. So I'm going to do the same. So my fluxes stabilized equal to the fluxes plus this addition I presented before is the same. Now my fluxual matrix will be the derivative of a fluxes with respect to unknown variable. Okay. So if you look at this term, what is this? Just a Taylor series expansion up to linear. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say fluxes. That depends on the argument. The argument will be u plus the increment of u, if you want to say it. That, that will be my u stabilized. So u stabilized. So fluxes stabilized equals to fluxes that depends on unknown stabilized. And this stabilized unknown equal to unknown plus the perturbation that depends on stabilizing parameter and residual. So now you really do not involve any constitutive parameters. And this is what they call variational multi-scale approach. Again, was proposed by Tom Hughes in 2004. So really, thing is, when you do the petrov galakin you modifying the fluxes. Then the VMS is now, they're going to rewrite things. Instead of perturb the fluxes, they perturb the unknown variable. It's much more easy to handle. Okay, with this all in place now, we need to discretize in finite elements. And again, I'll stick with something very, very simple because it's 1D. So it's going to be two node, linear shape function. And imagine I got a bar. I'm going to discretize with non-overlapping elements. And each element has this elemental length. That's my boundary. I could have forces and then forces at the other end. Okay. Now let's try to discretize it. So let's go for first the linear moment equation, then geometry conservation equation. So that's my linear moment equation. I'm going to stay with VMS, but it doesn't matter because it's linear elasticity. So those two, SUPG and VMS, they are the same. But I'm going to write the way like VMS. So that's my weak form for the linear moment equation. Now, first is I'm going to approximate my virtual field using finite element expansion, shape function, delta V, and not A. Okay. And for any arbitrary virtual velocity at not A, I could rewrite in this expression, which is you put a shear function and A here. And then those are the boundary force. Structure multiplied by area will give you the boundary force. And, and then you go to boundary. That's a direct delta function. Depends on which position are you in. Because those are two boundaries. It's a boundary force. And then you got a source term. And then this, I will call it as external force. So F at not A, of course. Then that will be the internal virtual work. So Piola, F stabilized, which is here. And then the gradient of a virtual will be the gradient of the shift function. And I'll call T, which is the internal force. And of course, this will be equivalent for each and every node. That we add not A, one and two, blah. Okay. Now I'll go further. I'm going to approximate my time derivative of my unknown variable. I'm going to use the same. I'm going to go for, sorry, linear momentum equals to finite expansion, sum of the shear functions, and then the linear momentum. So this is like a separation of variable. So the shear function takes into account space, and then the variable will be in time. If I take the time derivative, because that's what I need, now it wants to do the space. So the shear function won't change. You change the unknown variable. And this P dot is just the time derivative. Substitute this into that. What do you have? You have consistent mass matrix multiplied by the rate of the linear momentum that equals to external force, internal force. And this is each and every node. Now you do the assemble. You're going to have a massive consistent mass matrix. And then the time derivative of the linear momentum equals to the external force and the internal force. Things that you careful is this internal force. This internal force depends on, that's a linear momentum equation. So it depends on F and depends on the residue of the F. So it's time derivative in there, okay? So that's the linear moment equation. Now let's go for the geometry equations. You've got to follow the same strategy. So that's the big form. And first is go to the virtual field using finite element expansion. So you do the same, you can end up with this term. That's the boundary, not forces. This is a boundary velocity because you solve the F equation. And that's the internal. So external contribution, 
internal contribution for node A. And then you do the same expansion for the rate of the unknown variable. So do that, take the time derivative, exactly the same. Substitute back in there, you end up with a consistent matrix, time derivative of the unknown variable that you solve, external contribution, internal contribution for each and every node. Assemble, you end up with a big one, then external, internal, things again, but careful is this internal depends on velocity and the right-hand side of your first equation. Now, if I use the linear shear function, let me try to see a very simple one. If I do the linear shear function, so the linear shear function in isopartic domain and one and two, because those two nodes, if you take the derivative is constant, fine, it's standard. I only need one quadrature point, which is fine. It's going to be center of the element. If you take the derivative of the shear function, it gives you a cost that depends on the elemental length. So it's very standard. However, if you apply this now into those two equations that I just mentioned, and you assume that it is the uniform elemental length, and you ignore the body force, and you use the lamp mass, what happens is for the interior node, so this is the boundary, you're going to end up with this. The time derivative of the linear momentum equal to divergence of the piola. But what is this? This is just a central difference. And then you plus a blue font here, which is the SUPG stabilization. Now imagine that you put out F equal to zero. You say, I, no, let's go for boot knob garlicine. So what you do is you tempted to update the linear moment equation using central difference approximation for the divergence piola. If you do that, you do not consider the winning direction of the flow. That's a reason why when you add this term, he's trying to shift the whole direction into the outwitting direction. That's called SUPG. If you look at this, it's very interesting. People tempted to do is the following. If they do not use SUPG, they do not have the time, right? So what is this term? This is Laplace velocity. So basically, it's you add viscosity, you add Laplace and velocity to the solid dynamics equation because you know you need viscosity. But if you do that, you affect the order of convergence. So in SUPG, you got this additional term and try to make sure that that's the residual. So that as you refine, this term should always go faster than this term. So you don't affect the convergence. Similarly, if you go to the second equation, it's the same. The time derivative of the F equals to gradient velocity. So what is gradient velocity? Central difference will be this. And then you've got this stabilization that depends on the residual to handle uh, consistency and also convergence. Now you're operating in time. I'm going to go very quickly now. Uh, I'm conscious with the time. So we move into the time integrator. So the time integrator will be, you, um, you got a mass, first equation, you got a mass matrix, you got the rate of the unknown variable, and this is just the out balance force, which is the difference between external and internal. And then you got the F equations. If you stack them both together, that's what you got here. But this out balance depends on U dot because that's a residual. If you decided to go for explicit and the one, you could go any explicit that you want. You go for foil, oiler, second stage, four stage, or hunch good, it's up to you. But what we tempted to do is because my space, I always interest in linear shear function, second order. So I'll go in pair. So my time step, I'll go for second order in time. So that the overall convergence will be second order. So imagine that you go for second order or hunch good scheme. In this case, what we tempted to do is you move forward oiler. From there, you move forward Euler again, and then you take the average between the first one and the last end will be here. But one thing border is, if you look at these intermediate stages, one and two here is, you got this rate of the derivative and you got this rate of the derivative that depends on the same stage. It's annoying. So you need to solve it implicitly. So you need to go for either neutral Raphson or fixed point iteration. Luckily, what we got is, our second equation, I do not stabilize. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the stagger approach. I solve my second equation first. Once I got a residual, I pass the first equation and I solve the linear moment equation. Then this will allow me not to use the iterations. And then of course, when I do explicit, it has to be controlled by delta t and the delta t will be uh, CFL, characters length divided by CP. And this CP is important. So this CP is the maximum wave speed but in this case linear elasticity will be the pressure wave if you start to go for the non-linear elastic model you need to be able to find the close solution for this guy if not 
you affect your time step stability. And then, moreover, we use Lamas. So we're going to do Lamas and then it can be inverted easily. I will not go through this flow because Kalem will take you through uh, in the hands-on sessions. And just a summary is, in this talk, I've summarized 1D conservation equation for linear elastodynamics. I've shown you it is well posed. So I check hypervelocity eigenvalues. And then if the Hamiltonian is convex, I'm able to express another set of equation in terms of different unknowns, which is conjugate fields. And then I start to build first the weak form, which is unstable. If you perturb the conjugate field, you end up with petrogolokine. And there is a relations between petrogolokine and VMS. So petrogolokine is you perturb the fluxes, VMS, you perturb the unknown variables. Once you got a weak form sorted, you're going to discretize in space. In this case, you use linear two naught finite element discretization that we evolve in time using time degrader. And this is some history of our development. I go, I just need one minute very quickly. So we started uh, first order conservation law using Petrovella came back in 2014. So that's our first paper. And then we move into fully incompressible, but we still stick with the linear function. Then we start to borrow technology from the fluid. So we solve the fully incompressibility dynamically using fractional step or artificial compressibility. Then we start to move on to, we propose this tensor cross product to simplify the algebra. And we use this tensor cross product in part two paper, we use this tensor cross product to be able to go for fully incompressible. And we also provide this stress rate equation that I just presented. And recently in part three, we move into firmer. We add firmer, but we make sure that the model will be body convex. So convex with respect to things that I just mentioned. And now is also with entropy because it's temperature. And then we also explore different formulation like updated, updated reference. We use either finite volume or SPH, or we do different schemes to step the leg like as well. And then Recently, we got a paper with Callum and we try to explore this mixed formalism, but now into contact. Uh, but unfortunately, that in that paper, we, we went for final volume because that's much more uh, easier to address because we got a remand solver and things like that. And if you want to understand more about the presentation that I'm doing here, actually, you could go to this book. So we published in 2021 and this book start presented classical solid dynamics, then you present the new mixed formula that I presented here, and then we carry on with total Lagrangian, updated Lagrangian, Eulerian, and petrogalakin stabilization also in there. And there are some little code uh, in MATLAB is also there they could play with. So if you want more detail, um, there'll be, everything will be in this book. Uh, that, that's all for my presentation. Thank you.